You are listening to The Grandest Tour by The Cycling Podcast. Brought to you by iWoka. Flexible loans built for small businesses. iwoca.co.uk Hello, my name's Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. And once again, joining us, Ian Boswell. Hey, Richard. Hello, Ian. Hello, Lionel. My head is spinning. I feel a bit dizzy after a day of trying to keep up with three different bike races. What? Did, how did you? What were the practicalities of this for you, Lionel? How did you? How did you manage this? Well, I made myself a cappuccino and uh, a Belgian waffle, and then I had some ham on. I so might have I was, known. I, I might have known well, there'd be a, a food, a food-based answer to this. I was stocked up. Did you watch the racing at all, or did you just eat? <laughs> I did watch the racing as well, um, but you know, whilst sort of licking my fingers and, and reaching for plates of things, uh, I did miss some crucial action. No, it was good fun, wasn't it? Because um, everything was quite well coordinated today. There was the women's race at Depana, and then the Giro finished, got out of the way in time for us to watch the exciting bit of the Vuelta. So it's perfect. There was one odd moment uh, when I was watching the, the Vuelta and the Giro simultaneously and uh, Ben O'Connor attacked of NTT and at the same time an NTT rider crashed at the at the Vuelta. <laughs> I mean, you shouldn't laugh about that, but it was just uh, the, the, the sort of uh, differing fortunes of NTT at that precise moment. I can imagine Doug Ryder watching it going, yes, oh... <laughs> I was wondering whether, I was laughing because I was thinking that would just feed into your confusion about what on earth was going on. I found it quite mm. confusing on Sunday. I know you were at the Tour of Flanders, Richard, but Eurosport, they switched between the Tour of Flanders and the Giro. And the first, I wasn't aware they were going to be doing this, so I went out of the room to make a cup of tea, left them heading towards one of the cobbled climbs, and when I came back in, they were on a... An, an Italian Alp. It was very confusing. I, I, well, I was watching the Vuelta and became convinced at one point that I could see Diego Ulisi. And I thought, that how on earth has he done that? Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. A, tra- a mid-race transfer. You joke, but there is one rider, uh, Alexander Vlasov, Vlasov who's yeah. riding the Vuelta, having started the Giro. He pulled out of the Giro on stage two with stomach problems. But uh, So, yeah, that, that confusion... Uh, it's only well we only saw a fleeting glimpse of Vlasov in the in the Giro didn't we but he's been allowed to start the Vuelta but uh, yeah it's going to be quite some week watching a couple of races and in the case of tomorrow the men's race at Depana as well and Ian how did you manage this logistical puzzle to be quite honest I did not watch Depana this morning I uh, woke up and I did watch the final hour or so of the Giro and then because I'm in the U.S., I don't have Eurosport. I'm sure there's a way I could get a VPN and, and figure it out. But then I switched from from Flow Bikes over to NBC, two different carriers for watching the race. And so I was able to watch both. But um, with the slow Wi-Fi at my house, I don't think I could stream both events at the same time. So I'm just hoping that all the action comes at the end so I can catch both events. Well. I hope bo- both stages have now finished for you, have they? <laughs> Just before, about. Before we yeah. discuss them. That's, that's a relief. Wow. Well, in this episode, we're going to hear from Joe Dombrowski, um, whose Team UA, Team Emirates, has been at the centre of the latest COVID case to affect the Giro. We'll hear from him a bit later on. And we're going to divide the podcast up, I think, into parts as we discuss the the three races but Lionel do you have a not a tale of the tapas but uh headlines from the day yeah headlines from the day well what a day it was for Slovenia because at the Giro Jan Tratnik of Bahrain McLaren won stage 16 and I just have to say can I just say one thing about this sorry I know Mm -hmm. I'm breaking the rules already here but in his post stage interview he said that he attacked at the point in the course where his girlfriend was standing now, who has done that in the past? It's Primoz Roglic, another Slovenian. Do you remember that we did an event in uh, the Alps at our friend Shali Giataz a couple of years ago, That's and right. we met some Slovenians who told us that Roglic always attacks at the point where his girlfriend is standing, um, and they were expecting him to do the same the next day on Alp Duez. So anyway, just must be a Slovenian thing. 
Sorry, Lionel, carry on. Well, it was apt anyway, a Slovenian victory in the Giro, because they were tucked around the top uh, northeastern corner of Italy, very close to the Slovenian border. We'll talk about the Giro in part three of today's podcast. Before that, in part two, we will discuss a controversial sprint finish at the women's race in Depana and... In part one, we will kick off with another Slovenian victory, Primoz Roglic, who attacked where his girlfriend was standing on the course, I think, today. to win yeah, Roglic, I get that again. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm, but you, you said that they always do. This always. This is a Slovenian thing. Without, they always do fail. this. So, well, yeah, Primoz Roglic, the defending champion, picked up in the Vuelta where he left off. He is in the red jersey again after winning stage one uh, in the Basque Country. I mean, it was a real tour of the Basque Country or Itzulia style stage, wasn't it? I mean, an absolute humdinger. Um, the, the Vuelta is already whittled down to sort of half a dozen or so contenders after just 173 kilometers. I mean, there was no preamble whatsoever, no team time trial, no uh, no prologue. Obviously, the race was supposed to start in the Netherlands, wasn't it? But those three stages are impossible uh, because of the coronavirus situation. But I just thought it was as if somebody had called last orders at the pub and said that there weren't going to be enough drinks to go round. That was how they approached it. It's like a pub brawl, Lionel. Absolutely. It was like a pub brawl. Yeah, um, they they went at it on the last couple of climbs. And well, we don't know who's going to win the Vuelta, um, but we do have a pretty good idea that Chris Froome and Thibaut Pino won't be winning the Vuelta. They lost absolute fistfuls of time. So we'll talk about the Vuelta after this. You are listening to The Grandest Tour by The Cycling Podcast, brought to you by iWalker. Flexible loans built for small businesses. Join 50,000 customers taking on life's twists and turns and scaling new heights with iWalker. If you run a business, find out more at iwalker.co.uk. I W O C A.co.uk. Thank you very much to iWalker for sponsoring the cycling podcast. If you run a small business and you would like to have a look at the services that iWalker offer, uh, go to iwaka.co.uk and uh, have a look through the website. Flexible loans, basically, for your small business, whether you need a, a small amount of money or a large amount of money for uh, whatever purpose to get your business from this stage to the next stage. Uh, they promise a fast decision. You can get a yes or no from iwaka within 24 hours in the vast majority of cases. Very quick to apply online. And then when you do deal with iwaka directly, you'll be dealing with actual people so you get a kind of personal service as well go to iwaka.co.uk if that sounds like the sort of service your business could need so the vuelta chaps i think we're starting off with the vuelta tonight aren't we um and just a note on that uh one thing that we've done this year is we've uh, recruited teams of diarists audio diarists at the tour de france the giro and at the vuelta too and we're delighted to have nick glamini of uh ntt keeping an audio diary. Nick Schultz of uh, Mitch and Scott, who kept an audio diary for us last year at the Vuelta, and Scott Davis at Barry McLaren. So the three of them will be checking in with us and keeping us updated. We can send them questions as well. So if any of you have questions for them, pass them on to us. Also, Mitch Docker of EF Pro Cycling and George Bennett of Jumbo Visma uh, will be keeping us updated from time to time. We're going to check in with them as well and uh, hopefully get an insight into how their race is doing. George Bennett, obviously, um, could be particularly interesting on the team that he's on. He rode well today. He's also the subject of today's Kilometre Zero, powered by Zwift, uh, our Kilometre Zero series. So the latest episode is a chat with George Bennett, looking ahead to the Vuelta. And they were such a dominant team at the Tour de France. He said they weren't going to ride the Tour, the the Vuelta, in the same way, i.e. kind of controlling it. And I think, from the evidence of today's stage, it might be difficult to do that anyway, because as you said, Lionel, it looked chaotic. The 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 number of sort of possible winners has already been quite drastically whittled down, and the Vuelta anyway is is always kind of a, a different beast to the the Tour de France. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't help starting the Basque Country, does it? Because the racing there, well, the the roads there don't lend themselves to controlled racing. It's pretty chaotic, up and down, steep hills. And small roads, and uh, it was a, it was a well a cracking start to the race. I thought. Yeah, it was Richard, and well, we've seen the riders that have risen to the top. I mean, 
Primoz Roglic, the defending champion, just ahead of Richard Carapaz in, in the sprint finish. Dan Martin of Israel Startup Nation, third. Esteban Chavez of Mitchelton Scott. Felix Grosschartner of Bora Hansgrohe. Enric Mass of Movistar. And Hugh Carthy of EF Pro Cycling. Uh, then Sepp Kuss and George Bennett a little way back. And then, then you're talking almost a minute to the next group. And uh, de Moulin, Valverde, uh, Nieve, de la Cruz were in there. But then the big casualties, of course, um, Thibaut Pino and Chris Froome and well 24 hours ago Chris Froome was talking as if uh, the, the Vuelta was a, a, a matter of joint leadership on Ineos Grenadiers with Richard Carapaz and now having lost 11 minutes and 12 seconds to uh, the Roglic Carapaz group that is uh, well that is not the case is it and it was it was ironic really that the point where Froome was in trouble on the succession of climbs uh, coming into the finish it was around sort of 18 20 kilometers from the finish and it was when Ineos were setting a really fast pace and the other team that were up there were Israel Startup Nation uh, for Dan Martin I mean Dan Martin was prominent so his current team and his uh, future team were driving the pace at the point where Froome was in difficulty and it does look like a long a long road back for him I mean th- over three weeks there's plenty of time to um, you know ride himself up to the level and, and contest for stages maybe getting breaks and so on uh, but the the overall challenge for this welter is uh, is is gone on day one for him and it does already look like a shootout between Roglic and Canapaz last year's Vuelta and Giro champions. I was surprised to to flip over from the Giro to the Vuelta and see the race coming apart and you know this as you said it is in the Basque country and there's no there's almost no way to make a flat a flat course there and to see such an exciting race on stage one was you know it's it's awesome I don't know as a fan if it's actually going to make the race more exciting because people will be able to go up in breaks or if it is going to kind of nullify and just limit, you know, the GC contenders to to five guys in the first couple of days. But I also saw that, unfortunately, Mike Woods also crashed out and lost some time. And I think he was going pretty well coming into this race. I'm a little bit kind of confused as to why Froome was kind of speaking the way he was, you know, you said just 24 hours ago, because the team surely... You know, Enios and Tim Carrison surely knew what kind of form he was in. I'm sure Froome did as well. And to be quite honest, just with, you know, how few races have been on the calendar this year, I know that there's a lot of races going on now and teams are kind of running low rosters, just trying to, you know, make sure everyone's safe and healthy at the end of the season. But, you know, why Froome is actually, to be honest, why he's at this at this race, if they're there to try to win it, you know, I think Froome definitely wants to be there just to really get racing in and get a Grand Tour in his legs before next year. But with Ineos Grenadiers knowing that he's leaving teams, is that in a way benefiting, you know, Israel for 2021, giving him the opportunity to to do a long race like this? And, you know, obviously Froome has been with, with that organization for a long time now, and it's, you know, probably a good way for him to kind of go out. But, I mean, to be honest, being a, a former teammate of Froome's and a friend, it's it's – it's honestly kind of sad to see him like just continually struggling. I know this, this isn't the first time this year that, you know, maybe us, us fans have thought that Froome was going to be back to his former level and, you know, stage one, you know, it wasn't even, wasn't even like he was bluffing to, you know, he was on a bad day. He just straight up got dropped, but you did see his determination. I mean, the fact that he just kept fighting for so long is just a testament to, to Froome's mental fortitude. And I think we'll continue to see that throughout these next what 18 stages but i uh you know he could come better by the end but yeah it's uh it's like you said a long road back from where he was well let's hear what he said at the finish shall we great day for us with uh richie coming second uh right up there still in gc i mean he's our team leader here and we're we're going to be helping him as much as we can through throughout the race to try and get us a victory overall for me personally i uh, got a bit caught out coming into the penultimate climb and uh, started pretty far back and got stuck behind the, the crash at the bottom there i'm really happy to be here really happy to be racing a grand tour again after two years of not doing any grand tours just going to take the race day by day and keep trying to do as much for the team as i can throughout the race i still miss a little bit of that uh, top end from not having raced much um but definitely an improvement and um hope to hope to keep building throughout the race well that was from speaking at, at the finish and you know the language changed quite a lot in, in 24 hours he's speaking there as though it it wasn't a surprise and he wasn't particularly disappointed he said he was sort of 
caught in the wrong place. But I don't think those 11 minutes that he lost were due to positioning. Um, his his fitness is just not there, is it? And and we've seen it since racing resumed that it's it's not the Froome of old. He did talk about the importance of getting a, a Grand Tour in his legs, having not ridden one this year or last year. The last Grand Tour he finished was the 2018 Tour de France, wasn't it? Where he was third behind de Moulin and Geraint Thomas. It feels like quite a long time ago. Um, so who knows whether getting round the Vuelta might just be enough for him to go into the winter and work hard at regaining the form. But it's hard to see any way back for him. You know, I heard him on the radio this morning talking about wanting to try and win a, a fifth Tour de France. It's, it's almost impossible to imagine that but those who are, are close to Froome those who know him well and, and Ian you probably have some insight into this say that he's the most determined most dedicated um, individual they've ever they've ever come across and that if anybody can do that it's Chris Froome you know I've said that to multiple people who ask me even you know running up into the tour I was you know I think before he wasn't selected for the team I thought if there was someone who could come back from that injury and return to that same level it would be Froome but we've really seen so many kind of new names rise to the top of, you know, of Grand Tour GC contenders. And I think, you know, Nibli made a comment the other day over at the Giro kind of saying that, you know, these young these young riders, it's it's a different game. And I think that, you know, Froome, is he going to be, what, 36 next year, 37? 36, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that's getting up there for, for being a Grand Tour rider, especially just, you know, to be honest, saying what you just said, I, I have raced a Grand Tour more, more recently than... Chris Froome I did the 2018 Vuelta after the tour so who knows maybe I could make a comeback and uh <laughs> go I wouldn't for, rule it out Ian for... I wouldn't rule it out um <laughs> but I mean uh, for those the, the writers that did that did shine today Ro- Roglic is just um he he who does he remind me of um I thought today Sean Kelly you know it's just that relentlessness that that consistency um in his level of performance, it just it just doesn't really dip at all. He won this race last year. He's very good in a in a finish like that, isn't he? He's pretty fast, and and it was kind of perfect for him. Hugh Carthy had a really good go. I mean, they had a terrible day EF with uh, Danny Martinez first of all, and then Mike Woods having nasty crashes. Um, I was quite surprised at Vlasov. He he lost over four minutes today. I, I, he was a sort of dark horse for me, but I think. Of the guys that sort of stuck behind De Mula, I would not rule him out. You know, he's lost a minute today, but I don't think I would rule him out of the GC picture in this race because today wasn't a stage that would have really suited him. And I think once we get deeper into the race and that time trial, I mean, George Bennett said that he thought the overall would pretty much be decided by the stage 13 time trial. Um, uh, You know... um. I, yeah, I think he's still he's still in it. it. It's a it could be a sort of topsy turvy race, but um, yeah, it was interesting. I mean, Sepp Kuss for me was the man of the day in in a lot of ways. Just the way that he rode up the climb. Uh, it, it was a pity that he lost a bit of a, a few a handful of seconds in the end, but he looks incredible. And on any other team, he would be the the protected rider. Well, I mean, they're off to a flyer, aren't they, Jumbo Visma? I mean, Demula, fifty one seconds back. Hessink was in that group as well and then as you say Bennett and Kuss and the stage winner and they've got the red jersey but I mean on Roglic you say relentless I mean mentally so strong I mean just think back it's it's exactly a month today since the Tour de France finished and I know he was smiling on the Champs-Élysées and he was very magnanimous in defeat but just how crushing that that is a career ending defeat almost not not the fact that um that he lost the tour de france after leading it for so long but just the, the manner of that time trial and you could understand um anyone suffering almost a, a sort of traumatic response to to that and and wanting to kind of just um you know put the bike away for a few weeks and 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 just think about anything else and and obviously he's taking a completely opposite approach to getting over that defeat and re- and i suspect refusing to allow his career to be defined by the defeat to Tadej Pogacar in the Tour de France i mean already you know he came back he looked very strong at the world championships uh, you know there was obviously that little moment of controversy when some people thought he should have helped out his uh, Jumbo Visma teammate Wout van Aert in the, in the final there but then won Liège Baston Liège and now picking up where he left off in the Vuelta and with a team that he's got behind him he's going to be very very difficult to beat and already 
well, it's. I think it's. It is straight shootout between Roglic and Carapaz. And just a final little correction. Of course, Roglic's girlfriend wasn't standing where he attacked today, if indeed she was there at all, because she's now his wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, chaps. Before we move on to the the three days of Dapana, which is uh, obviously a a one day race for women and a one day race for men over two days, but in Dapana, which is at least something. The Vuelta mugs made by Stacey Snyder. Ian, you're a proud owner of a Stacey Snyder cycling podcast mug, I think, aren't you? I am indeed. I uh, drink my... It's it's my mug I use more for, for tea than coffee, but I uh, drink my tea out of it every night. Great. Well, Stacey made another batch, her final Grand Tour batch. There's Lionel holding up his mug there. She made her final Grand Tour batch of the season, uh, and they sold out very quickly, as they always do. Um, huge thank you to Stacey. Her hard work is very much appreciated and she always sends them out, posts them out the next day very efficiently. They can take a while to get to some people in some parts of the world, but be patient. They will arrive. And thank you very much if you bought one of Stacey's mugs, either here at the Giro or at the Tour de France. The Giro and Vuelta mugs are benefiting the Bahati Foundation in Los Angeles and the Black Cyclist Network in the UK. We've been delighted and proud to support some great causes this year, so there will be checks winging their way from Stacey. All the proceeds go to those uh, good causes. Thank you, Stacey. And a bit of news from us. We have a, a new partnership. It's a kind of cementing of an old partnership, LACA, bike insurance uh, we've got a long relationship with them they've been advertising in the podcast for a few years now um and they came to us wanting to uh, step it up a bit make it a bit more i don't know move from courting into a sort of a marriage between the cycling podcast and laca now if you sign up to laca bike insurance you will be directly supporting the cycling podcast laca have a lot of cycling podcast listeners as customers and they're keen to gather them together as a community within their greater community it's something that will develop so if you sign up to laca now as a cycling podcast customer you will be part of the cycling podcast community there and uh, there'll be other announcements that we'll make in due course about benefits and various perks and so on it's the same sign-up process as before. Go to laca.co.uk and enter the code TCP, and that will automatically put you into the Cycling Podcast community. If you are an existing LACA customer and you signed up as a Cycling Podcast listener, you will automatically be um, put into that community. So that's exciting, and we're very grateful to LACA for coming to us with this suggestion and for allowing the podcast to benefit directly from this initiative. So thank you to LACA and go to laca.co.uk and sign up with TCP. Well, onto the three days of the Pana, two single day races for men and women. And I think these races would have made more sense if Paris Roubaix was still on as a sort of bridge between Flanders and Roubaix. As it is, they, they are now the kind of end of the, the one day classics and, and a little bit of a damp squib with no disrespect to the Pana, but, um, not not quite the kind of going out on a high that you know Paris Bay would have provided. It's always a sprinter's race. Uh, we're expecting that tomorrow with the men's race. And today's finished with a, a sprint. And it was one, well, Yulin Dora of Bulls Dolmens crossed the line first. Uh, she was then relegated. And Lorena Vibus of Team Sunweb was given the victory. And, well, Sunweb tried... I mean, Lorena Vibus joined Sunweb mid-season from Park Hotel Valkenburg. And... Uh, that was quite a sort of controversial move, but she's a fantastic rider, a great sprinter. Hasn't really clicked yet with Sunweb, and, and they had a big lead out for her today, and it didn't really work. It was disrupted. Yulin Dora jumped early and got quite a gap, and then kind of drifted across the road, closed the door on Vibus as she started coming from behind, and it was deemed a, an illegal manoeuvre. I, I didn't feel it was. I've seen a lot worse. I thought Arnaud Demars maneuver on Peter Sagan at the Giro earlier um, was was more dramatic and at that point Sagan was actually kind of on Damar's shoulder so it was it was more dangerous in my view in this case Dur started drifting when Vibus was a good length or so behind and then Vibus tried to go through the gap as it was closing so I didn't think it was that dangerous and I, th I think if you jump first and get that gap you kind of earn the right to 
move a little bit and close the door on somebody if, if you want. I mean, the rules are a bit vague on well, that. Well, before we hear from Ian, let, let's let's say what the UCI rule is. It's uh, rule 2.3.036 on sprints. And this is, this is all it says. It says, riders shall be strictly forbidden to deviate from the lane they selected when launching into the sprint and in so doing endangering others. Now, the interpretation of that from, from those words is that Dura did deviate from the line she selected but she actually deviated from the line she selected by going around another rider early on in the sprint that was after she'd launched her sprint so uh, the the rule is on the one hand well it's either not fit for purpose or it's deliberately allowing the commissaires plenty of um, room for interpretation and uh, and I, I suspect uh, well, I don't want to prejudice what Ian's going to say from the rider's point of view, but the, the issue here is one of consistency, isn't it? And you could go back through the the recent history of, of the sprints and pick out incidents that have been uh, perhaps more blatant. I, I get what you're saying, Richard. You know, Dora had right of way if you like once you're in front and there's space behind the assumption when you're when you're watching is that the road belongs to the rider in front but there's nothing in the rules to allow that basically the, the rule says you're forbidden to deviate from the lane so according to the rule if it endangers others is how i read the rule there is that clause there as well and so then it becomes subjective did it was it um, endangering Rebus as she was coming up level and then kind of halfway up uh, door door? I'm I'd be really fascinated to hear Ian's point of view on this. I'll start by saying I was never a sprinter, so I don't really you know know what it's like to actually be you know traveling at those speeds in a in a bunch sprint. But having just been around the sport long enough and kind of seen what's really evolved not just here at this race today, but kind of over the whole season, starting with you know Jakobsen and Gronewagen and then at the tour with. Uh, Sagan and Sam Bennett. I guess he was with uh, Van Art, but it's it seems like the UCI has kind of made an internal decision to really try and start limiting what riders are allowed to do once they're sprinting. You know, I think for a lot of us, it it seems like I mean this this particular instance and doesn't really seem like she should have been relegated at all. I found the video online and looked at it, and I was like, this doesn't look. I mean, I, I didn't even notice that she was drifting at all, and. You know, it really kind of makes you wonder, like, well, what if they do want people to split sprint in a straight line? I mean, what's what does the future of sprinting look like? They get to the last 200 meters and there's painted lines on the road and it becomes like a, a velodrome sprint. And if you have the sprint lane, then no one can pass you on a certain side. Sprinting is a it's an incredibly dangerous thing. And, you know, there's been a lot made of, you know, Gronewagen's crash and Tour of Poland with with Jakobsen. And, you know, sprinters take incredible risk. And I mean, I'm of the very much of the opinion if you're in front, you you know, the people behind you are the ones that can really see what you're doing and they have the ability to break and move. There, it just, there has to be some clarity on this as far as what is actually deviating from your line. And today it doesn't seem like someone should have been relegated, but I mean, I was it a couple, couple of weeks ago at Terreno and Pascal Ackerman came up the inside and did this phenomenal move and slipped a gap and won the stage. And everyone was praising him for his bike handling skills, which was probably more dangerous than a rider on the front deviating their line because if you're coming from behind, the sprinter can't oftentimes see you. And I know that you know, there's been a lot made about, you know, sprinters need, you know, sprinting more carefully. But the last, I mean, there's a good chance that in the sprint today, you're you're looking down at the road in front of you and you, you don't even really realize that you're deviating because there are no lines on the road. Like I say, the, the Damar sprint in Brindisi with um, Sagan, that, that was a, a far more obvious deviation that was designed to close the door on Sagan and there weren't really many calls for Demar to be relegated then and and I'm not sure that he should have been I mean when there's physical contact I think that's when it becomes really dangerous uh, when you and, and that was the case of Grinewig and, and Jakobsen that was a factor in Jakobsen's crash there's always a danger as well that you 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 judge these maneuvers by their by their outcomes and you know, we saw Ackerman last week at Skelterpreis as well pull a really dangerous manoeuvre. You know, really try to get himself out of a, a boxed-in situation and veering quite dramatically and, and taking out some riders behind him. I think today was quite different. You know, she Yulindor jumped hard and very skillfully, I thought, sort of nullified the threat from Vibus, who's very quick and got that length or so lead that, that enabled her to then 
you know, close the, the door on the left-hand side and make it longer for Vibas to come around. Vibas then kept coming and in the end was coming through quite a narrow gap. But that was her, that was on her. You know, that was her decision to, to keep going through that gap. I thought Dora didn't really do anything wrong. So I, I think that was a poor decision. But I think you're right, Lionel. It's the the cons inconsistency is is a problem. But all, I mean, the, I think the rule has to be vague because it has to be about whether a manoeuvre is dangerous or not i think ultimately i think there has to be scope for riders to do things um you know in different scenarios yeah, but that's where it becomes absolutely subjective subjective uh, and, and it's whoever's yeah. watching and making the decision because if if vibus had been quicker it would have been more dangerous i mean that's uh, you know if she'd been coming up quicker as the gap was closing, it would have been a, a more dangerous looking situation and the risk of a collision or Vibus getting squeezed against the barriers would have been higher. But as she was kind of coming up uh, initially, you know, not, not quickly enough to, to, to really, uh, you know, draw level with uh, Duhura, then that, you know, the, the kind of the danger moment kind of passed and the line came and... She closed the Dura. <laughs> she closed the Dura on her. <laughs> somebody, somebody had to do it. I, th I think, I think you know, again, I go back to that point I made about the rider in front. In the whole history of bike racing, the rider in front assumes that they have right of way. That it's, a, you know, as, as long as then it's not a kind of a real, um, you know, a slamming the door shut in somebody... Um, which it certainly wasn't. It was a it was a slow enough squeeze. I think I I'm sympathetic to your point, Richard, that it was it was a harsh a harsh relegation and one that if that supplied across all bunch sprints in every race, we're going to see some really uh, well we're going to see some sort of watered down sprinting. And that isn't me saying that I what I want to see is you know elbow to elbow, shoulder to shoulder danger. I don't. I want it to be as safe as it possibly can. But at the end of the day, what people watching and we all we all kind of get caught up in it. Nobody wants to hit the ground. You know, nobody is thinking that they you know they want to come off badly in a sprint. So nobody is making a decision to you know everything is focused on getting to the line first, not thinking oh, I'll, I'll i'll have this person into the barriers i mean it, you know and i think we kind of from our detached um position we we perhaps sometimes you know see danger where perhaps it there wasn't any it's absolutely subjective i think the cycling podcast is supported by science in sport science in sport fueled by science Thank you to Science and Sport for their support of the Cycling Podcast. If you want 25% off all your Science and Sport products, go to scienceandsport.com and enter the code Lionel. SISCP25. Oh, never in doubt. SISCP25 at scienceandsport.com. And thank you very much indeed to them. Well, I mentioned earlier on that the mugs that we've been selling or Stacey Snyder has been selling will go to benefit, among other good causes, the Black Cyclist Network and Science and Sport are also big supporters of the Black Cyclist Network as well. That's nice to collaborate with them on that as well. On to the Giro then, stage 16 of the Giro d'Italia today. And um, I win for Jan Tratnik of Bahrain McLaren. Ben O'Connor up there with him, did a really good ride. He got away on the climb with Ben Swift and then dropped Swift, got across to Tratnik and you know seemed to be in the driving seat to, to win the stage a really much needed uh, win that would have been for NTT who are of course losing their sponsor in the year and Ben O'Connor featured in our episode of Clum to Zero that came out yesterday on that team did he make a bit of a mistake there Ian by not sort of well it would have been easier perhaps or less difficult had he caught um, Tratnik before the end of the climb and, and maybe gone straight past him easier said than done but is there anything he could have done differently to try and beat him because you would have thought coming from behind like that he would have been the favorite for all that Trotnik might have been a faster finisher. Yeah, I mean, and I think that Trotnik played it pretty well in the fact that, you know, he didn't really take a pull of the last K, which he didn't he didn't have to. And I think, yeah, had, had O'Connor caught him earlier on the penultimate climb and was able to maybe drop him there, he maybe would have, would have been able to, to hold him off. But, you know, there's really not a lot to do when you're not, when you're just not as fast. And I think, I mean, I was blown away when, you know, O'Connor attacked Trotnik couldn't get away, and then Trotnik just went over the top of him and gapped him, and it just seemed like Trotnik was was the stronger rider today. And and who knows, maybe if you know Ben had you know kind of waited and brought Swift across and some other riders, then maybe it would have been a bit more dynamic. Sometimes when it's just one on one, it can be you know he knew that he had one spot to try and to try and distance Trotnik, and 
he couldn't do it. But yeah, I mean, it was it was a heck of a ride by by Trotnik. He was out there a long time, and I've I've spent some time um, racing with him, and he's a he's an awesome guy. He's incredibly powerful, and it seems like he's always winning. Well, whenever he wins, he usually wins in in a similar fashion from from a breakaway or or alone. He's a guy that you know clearly has has a big engine on him. Indeed, he well he needed that engine today because it was a long, long stage, two hundred and twenty nine kilometers. Uh, pretty cruel the morning after the rest day a, an early start a real kind of jolt to the system after um after a day off from the racing and uh, Tratnik was in a well it was a huge break that went away wasn't it 28 riders in it ag2r had four in there including uh, larry warbass but it was it was when manuele boado of astana and Tratnik got clear 50 kilometers plus from the finish Tratnik was out there either with Boado or alone, and then later on with uh, O'Connor, of course. And, uh, yeah, really impressive ride by Tratnik. And a, a big boost for Bahrain McLaren, the first Grand Tour stage win of their season, first Grand Tour stage win for Rod Ellingworth since uh, he's been at Bahrain McLaren. The other notable things from today were a sort of ding-dong battle for the King of the Mountains jersey. At the moment, Giovanni Visconti is in the blue jersey, uh, but Ruben Guerrero is uh, pushing him hard. Um, Guerrero went over a couple of the climbs uh, in front and then had a problem with his bike and he uh, got stuck in the big rings and Visconti uh, took advantage of that so Visconti still in the blue jersey but that battle looks like it's got some way to go and then at the finish I mean it was a strange day for the GC riders we did see them kind of just riding sort of two by two and a little bit of through and off at one point chatting away uh, not not putting too much into it I'm always uh, reluctant to say that because it's 229 kilometers in what looked like pretty chilly weather but at the finish Joao Almeida clipped away again and pinched another couple of seconds so perhaps a little statement of intent having conceded quite a chunk of his advantage on Sunday before the rest day that he's not going to lie down and let Wilco Kelderman take the Giro from him but uh, well, big big day tomorrow with uh, Madonna di Campiglio. The I think at around about fifteen hundred meters, that stage certainly looks like it will be fine weather wise. Um, so another big test for Almeida tomorrow. It was a lot of effort by Almeida for not not too much gain. I thought in the end, mm. um, just a couple of things you mentioned. Larry Warbass was in that group. He he's moved up to the top twenty overall, nineteenth overall, which is pretty decent. He's been in a couple of breaks. Well. Ben Swift is 23rd overall at the Giro d'Italia, which is quite remarkable. And I just wondered a question for Ian. Um, Swift obviously wanting a stage win and he was up there today. But, you know, there's been some talk of Tailgig and Hart being a, a real contender for overall victory here. Do you think that will be what they're thinking? And, and if so, it's not really the Ineos style, is it, to put someone in the breakaway when they've decided that you know, they're going to get behind someone on, on GC. Ben Swift, potentially a really important guy for Teo, Gig and Hart over the coming days. Given Teo's performance on Sunday, I think he's definitely been given, I mean, clear leadership role for, for GC, but I don't think that Enios is going to put the resources towards it like they would if they had a, you know, Carapaz or Froome or, or Thomas there like we've seen in the past. I think it's going to be very much like a free role and he'll have some riders to be around helping him, but Riders, you know, they've already won, what, is it five stages at this tour or this Giro? Um, so I think they're going to continue to hunt stages and they'll support Teo when he's needed. But on a day like today, you know, having Swift up the road and, you know, going for his own ambitions, I don't think he's really going to take away from Teo's, you know, desire to try and, you know, secure a, a podium finish. I wasn't joining you guys on Sunday, but yeah, that was a phenomenal performance from Young Scotsman. Doppel, the young Ian Boswell, I like it. The young Ian Boswell doppelganger. Yeah, well, um, uh, I think he has. You and he not not dissimilar in appearance. No, he has more. He has more freckles than I do. You know him well, Ian. I mean, how do you think he'll be approaching these next few days? I mean, it it must be so tough to, you know, you've got fourth place in your hand, but anything it could go either way, couldn't it? I mean, especially one, with the one second of off third. Stages. Once exactly one second off third, there's something, you know, a small step forward, and it could be a podium place or even better. Who, I mean, who? That's the thing about this last week. There, it's uh, it's very very open, and although the gap itself is quite big, we just don't know how anyone will respond to um, the, the you know the the bigger climbing stages. And when uh, Beppe Martinelli, who's seen a few Grand Tour winners in his time, the boss of Astana, says that. Um, 
you know, basically says Gagan Hart is uh, the the one to watch, if not the the favourite. I mean, that's quite a statement. I mean, it could there's there's no reason for Martinelli to kind of squeeze the pressure on Gagan Hart because his uh, his guy Fulsang is out of the picture. So that's not not even mind games. You can't attribute that to mind games. So I mean, how do you think Teo will be uh, taking this? I mean, it's a huge breakout performance, and I know Teo's kind of been knocking on the door. He had a good ride last year at Tour of the Alps, and he's kind of had a rough go at at Grand Tours, you know, he hasn't really been able to put a great three weeks together. And I mean, just having spent time with him, I know he really wants, as any young rider does, they want to, they want to ride the tour. He's built a really good relationship with Bernal. And I think that a performance like this beyond just this Giro, you know, could really put him in, in the long list or the short list for, for next year's Tour de France. But I think, uh, I mean, I, I think it's an awesome position for Teo because I don't feel like there's a ton of pressure on him. He didn't go into the race with you know, sole leadership, you know, obviously Thomas was there, he crashed out. And now, you know, Teo's in this position where he's able to go for, you know, a podium finish without really having the the pressure and expectation. I'm sure there's kind of mounting internal pressure, just knowing Teo, you know, personally wanting to, to perform well. But I think as long as he can kind of just keep his head cool and doing what he doing what he does and not worrying about the consequences of, of attacking and, you know, going too deep that you know, he really could finish on the podium and he's, you know, I say he's a young rider, but he's not, not all that young now. He's been, been in the world tour for four or five years now. So he's, he's experienced, you know, he's in a team that they know how to manage a rider of his position and just, you know, being up there on GC, I think that, um, yeah, it's got to be incredibly motivating for, for the gingered Teo. He's (laughs) he's 25, he's 25, which kind of passed it these days, isn't it? Um, but speaking of mind games, uh, Nibali said at the finish today that Kelderman, Wilco Man's biggest threat is perhaps Jai Hindley, <laughs> his teammate, <laughs> who he obviously observes as going very, very well. And, you know, if, if Tail Gig and Hart is, is in with a chance of winning, then so is Jai Hindley if if Wilco Man falters. But I think I mean I think you're right. You know, in Grand Tours, you know, momentum is important, isn't it? And and Tail's got some momentum behind him. Will Command's kind of holding on to that momentum that he's had really from the start. But, you know, Nibali's such a, a, a kind of seasoned campaigner and he, of all people, knows how these la- last stages in the high mountains, assuming they all run okay, could, again, the race could really turn on its head again. I mean, we might see, we might still see Nibali riding away with it and then we'll look at that and go, well, that was always going to happen, wasn't it? <laughs> because that's what we do. If that is the case, I mean, I would point back to today's stage and the fact that, you know, it was it was a hard finishing circuit that they did. And the fact that none of the big GC contenders outside of Almeida made a move, you know, could be a sign that, you know, Nibli is plotting something for the high mountains. Because had he wanted to, you know, try something and, you know, snag a few seconds, I'm sure he, he could have tried something like that today. Maybe it didn't wouldn't have worked. But, you know, the fact that he didn't, didn't try anything today could be a sign that he is plotting something for the days to come. Well, there was some other news from the Giro this morning, wasn't there, when it was announced that a rider from UAE Team Emirates, who uh, it later emerged was Fernando Gaviria, and the uh, staff member at AG2R, who I gather is the, what we gather now is the, the team chef, had tested positive for coronavirus. Gaviria, of course, was one of the people who was at the UAE tour way back in the spring when coronavirus kind of hit pro cycling. It was certainly the, the first sport to really be hit by uh, the coronavirus situation, and Gaviria was uh, in hospital what we can't really say is whether or not this uh, coronavirus positive means that he's been reinfected or not. All, all we know at the moment is that, that he is uh, he is positive and so did not start the stage today. Um, Joe Dombrowski, who's been keeping an audio diary for us, he has sent in a, a report of what happened from his perspective. Hi, guys. So, yeah, obviously a pretty eventful overnight for us when we learned that Fernando was positive. We got a message from Michele de Grandi, our team doctor here, just everyone to stay in their rooms and just not really to do anything until we got further instruction. Then someone arrived and did a second test, which apparently was also positive. In regards to Max, he's had a cough, an ongoing cough that's been problematic for him, which is why he stopped today. But there was someone 
arriving actually last night, not from the JIRA organization, but from the World Health Organization, did two full PCR tests on him and confirmed that he was 100% negative just because we wanted to be totally safe. For the rest of the team, we were all negative. We have not been tested yet as a follow-up, but from what I understand, we are meant to be tested again, I think, tonight, and that may continue going forward for the next days just because obviously we've all been in relatively close contact um you know there were two positives coming out of the race today one with fernando and one of the staff in ag2r and we were both in the same hotel the last four days so i would imagine that we may have continued tests just to err on the side of caution obviously you know we do all that we can and in terms of there's been people sanitizing the room every night um you know we're wearing the masks everywhere lots of hand sanitizer and just trying to maintain distance and yeah i mean it's disappointing i we were all just the all us riders were just kind of sitting in the lobby in the hotel last night not really sure what to think we didn't really have all the information at the time and i was concerned even whether we were all going to start tomorrow or not but in the end it, it was limited to only fernando uh max did dnf today but and he has had a cough but we've confirmed with further testing that it's not related to COVID. And he actually had COVID already back in UAE tour. Me personally, I'm just fine. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to the rest of the week. Obviously it's a little disappointing to lose one of your teammates, but it's a pretty strange year for everyone. And I think we just have to do everything we can to look out for uh, public health. There's another round of coronavirus testing for all of the teams at the first batch tonight roughly half of the teams are being tested tonight including UAE team Emirates and the other half will be tested tomorrow night after the stage no indication as to whether UAE team Emirates will be subject to additional monitoring as Joe explained Max Richese also pulled out of the race today uh, he's been uh, coughing but it's not uh, coronavirus related so that's that's something and it does seem after the first kind of the first wave of positive tests um you know one rider and one staff member from the next um serious batch of testing it does feel like the the, the jira will will make it to the finish um at, at touchwood as long as there aren't further positive tests from this next round of coronavirus tests um i just wanted to say something about the the vuelta rich because there were a couple of uh, well there were three riders who didn't finish the first stage today including former vuelta stage winners Matthias frank and alexandra geniers and also one of the debutants sunweb's ilan van vilda uh, he was one of 48 riders making their grand tour debut in this Vuelta. So out of a field of 176, 48 have never ridden a Grand Tour before. That's obviously a consequence of this season being packed into uh, a couple of months or so. But Ian, that's, uh, you know, that's, will that have any bearing on the racing, do you think, that, that there's a lot of riders that haven't done a three-week race before? Yeah, the fact that there are so many new riders definitely could play into the you know, the overall racing. I think we even potentially saw that today with, you know, a lot of first time Grand Tour riders are really told to, you know, take it easy. It's three weeks, you know, save yourself. And there could be a lot of riders, you know, we could see some big groupettos with riders, you know, just making sure that they can endure three weeks of racing. But that said, you know, just to contradict myself, we've seen so many young riders, you know, in their first Grand Tours really excel. So it really depends on the riders. And it has been a kind of a crazy couple months with packed in racing, but yeah, that's that's an awful lot of debutantes at, at one Grand Tour, and it kind of brings the Vuelta back to the old days of the Vuelta when it was oftentimes the first Grand Tour that riders would be sent to. And just briefly, and uh, the the two races going on at the same time, as you reflect on your career, do you, do you have a favorite out of the Giro and the Vuelta? Oh, I mean, I I only did one Giro in my career. Um, I did three Vueltas. I'd probably, I mean, I just loved racing in Spain. You know. It, this year is different because the Giro is all of a sudden in, in October. But I just love the style of racing of, of Spanish roads. And, you know, oftentimes the weather's going to be better. And, you know, I kind of touched on it last week when I was with you guys that Italian racing has a very distinct characteristic of how the race is done. And that's, you know, kind of why I thought Ulisi tends to perform well in Italy. And it's a style of racing that never really suited me as much as racing in France or, or in Spain. Yeah, things are just a little bit less chaotic 
racing in Spain than racing in Italy. Well, Ian, I think you'll be joining us again, won't you, later in our grandest tour coverage, by which time it'll just be the Vuelta. Yeah, that'll be uh, that'll be easy. <laughs> just one race, <laughs> one race a day. And you're off fishing in the meantime, is that right? I am, yes. I'm going on a what is becoming an annual fishing trip with my younger brother. Put away my computer, nice. telephone, and recording device for a week and uh yeah head off got, on we got all your Shim- got all your shimano reels and <sighs> stuff oh i i wish yeah i uh <laughs> yeah i was always surprised when i got into fishing and realized that shimano also makes fishing equipment durace electronic uh, <laughs> um do you <laughs> electronic fishing equipment. I, I, I used to be a very keen fisherman myself though um ian can you tell me where you're going and what you're fishing for heading out to the border between oregon and idaho on the snake river and we'll be catching, well, I was out there last year, actually. Yeah, you should try to come out one year, Richard, for it. Love to. But yeah, we'll be catching steelhead, salmon, bass, trout. And we also last year caught a few sturgeon, which I'm not sure it's, I mean, this was a, a 10 foot. It's like a three meter long fish. It's like a dinosaur. Wow. Um, yeah, they're just like a big wow. bottom feeder. And we'll be catching some sturgeon. Those will not be on, on fly rods. That's on like a semi down, like, you know, deep, deep ocean type rig. Um, but yeah, it's a float, a float trip. So we'll be on, on rafts floating down the river and fishing along the way. That sounds great. I love it. It does. I want a full <laughs> report uh, on, on that when you get back. Um, and we'll do an episode of explore on, uh, oh, on yeah, the fishing great. trip. Yeah. <laughs> on a pedalo. Um, are you tomorrow night? Is it Francois Thomas will joining us tomorrow night, Lionel? I think it is. Yes. And Lizzie Banks will be joining us as well for some episodes. In the meantime, um, can we just say a few thank yous to friends of the podcast? Very grateful indeed to those of you who've signed up at thecyclingpodcast.com. And for me, a big thanks to Declan McKernan, David McCook, Jonathan Cornelius, Sean Dwyer, Stephen Price, Jason Harriman, and Philip Scott. And thank you to Richard Gorski, Alexandra Jacques, Lawrence Colby, Lewis Patterson, Thomas McElligot, Jaime Garcia Nogales, and Malcolm Hart. And last but not least, Christy Howard, Mark Middleton, Henry Engels, Colin Gerzbowski, Piers R- Rendell, Mark Prendville, Mark Childerstone, Robert Graham, and Yez Nabarro. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. <laughs>